So last week I already said about the big reveal that it was towards the end of the class and it was a little bit rushed. So we have um, Arjuna beat the entire Astinapur army. And when they came back, he gave all the credit to the son, Virat's son, whose name is Uttar. And the daughter is Uttara, I think. Um, but then pretty much the next morning, they reveal who they are, um, properly dressed in royal clothes. And the King Virat's taking a little bit of time to like, really? Give you this dress? And where's the Pandavas? But they're all standing there. Like the rest of the Pandavas are all standing there. So, um, but <clears throat> Yudhishthira had chosen this kingdom because Virat was a noble person and Yudhishthira would not have lived in a kingdom where there wasn't dharma. So when it does come around, when he does finally realize that Yudhishthira is Yudhishthira, he, he asked for apologies. I said, you know, in this last year, if we have done anything to offend you, and we honored that you have. Actually, it's the son, Uttar, who gets really, uh, like, we're so lucky you chose our kingdom to hide in and that you've been here with us because, you know, he's been on the chariot with Arjuna, right? And, he, so, and it was like this, whoa, experience for him. Can, I, can you imagine he's this sweet little kid who hasn't really done anything and then suddenly he's at Arjuna's chariot and uh, fighting Bhishma, fighting Drona, fighting Karna. And it was, there was so much excitement in that day. And then he, at the, he was told like, no, you cannot say anything yet. So Yudhishthira says. So when Yudhishthira does say who they are and Virat is struggling to come to grips with the fact that they really are the Pandavas, the prince comes in and he's like, no, no, really, you should have seen him on the chariot and he did this and then this happened and then he was running so fast and then I couldn't manage it. So he was holding the chariot and he was shooting and he was like so excited. Literally, he was like this little kid who was so excited. <clears throat> and I guess because when it happened also, he couldn't say it. So it was all held in and then it all pours out. And it's, uh, this is where you see the Mahabharata is really good with all these rasa. Rasa is all the different types of emotions that you see. Uh, <clears throat> so now, like, this is incredible. Like, what was Yudhishthira? That Virat lets Yudhishthira and Draupati now sit on the throne. In his, his kingdom, his court, his palace, and Yudhishthira and Draupati are sitting on the throne. Also out of gratitude that Arjuna had saved the kingdom from Hastinapur. There is that and it's not like, you know, just because you, you distress it, but it was, they had actually helped them. Um, and then I already mentioned this last week that they had said um, Uttara would marry Arjuna. And Arjuna was like, but I've treated her like a daughter. And so and I can't suddenly now treat her like a wife. And so she can marry my son, Abhimanyu. And so the minute that's said, messengers get sent. You know, sometimes we think we're so efficient with WhatsApp and emails, but like Abhimanyu literally turns up the next day and they have the wedding. I don't think we're so efficient, huh? Like it's, like how did the messenger go so fast? Get to Dwarka and tells Krishna and Subhadra that, you know, Arjuna said Abhimanyu is getting married and it's not even like Abhimanyu is like, what, you want me to get married? Not and Subhadra as the wife is like, how can you decide without no, none, none of that? Oh, Arjuna wants Abhimanyu to get married. Let's go. <laughs> they pack the whole, the whole kandan. Everybody goes. So one messenger goes to Dwarka to tell Krishna and Subhadra and Abhimanyu, of course, to please come because <laughs> it's his wedding. And another messenger has gone to uh, Drupata because um, I guess that's their in-laws, Draupati, of course. Um, but there, there was this beautiful connection that they maintained with Drupata. And you know, maybe it's because the, the Drupata's boon that he was going to fight Dronacharya. And so there was, but I think it really was love for Draupati in the sense of they, they're the sons now, right? If they've married Draupati, it feels more like that than more anything else it's that and also this horrible that they've had to be in exile for all these years and so and now there's this wedding like literally exile ends wedding two days after it's it's never a dull moment in the pandava's life 
or if there was, we didn't read about it because it was too dull and it didn't make it to the story. <laughs> um, so Drupada comes with the other, with Draupadi's five sons. And I guess they would be there at uh, Abhimanyu's wedding because, you know, they're brothers. Um, and so this, you know, unfortunately, we don't, we don't, there isn't much content that I've come across. Although the more I read and the more I research, I do slowly come across more things. I've, in more, I've come across a lot more content on Nakula and Sahadev. But yeah, haven't it's come about as much content on the, the five sons of Draupadi. But in this section, there's quite a bit on Abhimanyu. And so Abhimanyu was really, really, really loved. Um, so he's the son of Subhadra and Arjuna, and he looks a lot like Krishna because of Subhadra's genes. Mm -hmm. um, and he's, the, he's so liked by everyone, like every single... You know, there are some people like that, that they have this special connect with different members of the family. It's not this generic that they have that. And in most families, you'll find one or two people who have a special connect. But you'll find rare, you'll find one person who manages to have a special connect with every member of the family. Um, they really do stand out, those people. <clears throat> Abhimanyu was that person. He managed to have a very special connect with the, all the five Pandavas, with Draupadi, who's not his mother with Draupadi's father, uh, Drupata, uh, with Krishna, with Balram, of course, with his own parents. <clears throat> and so very, very, very well managed. Um, and then this section is like, it's cute because it's completely arranged this marriage. They haven't seen each other. They meet the morning of, they get married like two hours later. But there's this full-fledged romance. Like they, they love each other at first sight. Uttara is very beautiful. Abhimanyu, when in the description of the wedding, when Agni Devata was invoked for the two of them to walk around the fire, Agni Devata says that Abhimanyu was the most charming and handsome groom he has ever seen. And I'm thinking, you know, Arjuna got married, Krishna got married. Who's <laughs> but Abhimanyu is given this place by Agni Devata to be the most handsome and charming groom he has ever seen. So he surpassed Krishna here, huh? <laughs> In Agni Devata's eyes. Or maybe Agni Devata also, like I said, Abhimanyu had this special connect. And you know, if you don't know the Mahabharata, then the only thing you'll know about Abhimanyu is how he dies even that will touch your heart. So there really is something about Abhimanyu that really um, manages to, to win people's heart over. So when he comes to Virat's kingdom and gets off the chariot, first person he goes, so he's come with Krishna. Krishna, Subhadra, Abhimanyu are in the chariot together. He goes and he bows down to Yadishthira. You see that so it's the right thing to do. Okay. And Arjuna is his father, but he bows down to Yudhishthira. And we know enough now to know that's what Arjuna would want. Hmm. And so he has that. It, the word we use is samskar. Um, and in English, what we do, it doesn't translate, samskar doesn't translate to it, but in English, we would use the word cultured. And this is, this is when someone's cultured, then the way they behave is, is this. Um, and he, and because Drupada is there and he's elderly, again, that respect that he gives. And then the affection with which he greets his brothers. And, it's, and then, of course, this little romance between him and Uttara, which is very, very cute. 
Um, she's also very, very beautiful and, you know, young and probably the sense of Arjuna has been with teaching her for this last year and Arjuna has developed this affection for her. And poor Abhimanyu wasn't with Arjuna for this last for 13 years, 12 years, whatever it was. And so connection to the father also. <clears throat> So the wedding is planned very quickly and, and executed very quickly. And yeah, it's really nice that it, it was done those days that way. Because today when I see this, you know, the year long saga of preparing for a wedding, I so painful. And how long did it take them to arrange this wedding? A day, two days. <laughs> Would it would it have been less festive? No. Would it have been less grand? No. Like you know, flowers are available. You take out the decorations. You wear the nice clothes. The music's there. Musicians there. Dancers there. Food, always available. <laughs> so, very very festive. Very uh, happy. Very uh, cute. Actually, this it's it's not too many incidences in the Mahabharata can be described as cute. This would qualify. If anything in the Mahabharata can be described as cute, Abhibanyu marrying Uttara is very, very cute. <laughs> um, even funerals in the old days. It was done on that day. Max the next day. But usually on the day. It's... it's it, one incredible efficiency, but also in terms of, I know when, when we study Bajagavindam, Guruji always says that how much in, everything is important and we give it the right amount of importance, then it works really well. The minute we start giving things more importance than what they are, we kind of lose balance and we kind of lose that sense of holisticness. So if you're planning a wedding for like a whole year, you're giving it way too much importance. Right? The ceremony is not what's important, which is now my favorite line to say to any couple who come for blessings. The ceremony is not what is important. <laughs> How you live after that is what is important. <laughs> Like really, ceremony is one day, two days, three days, maximum a week. But then that's it. it's an event. Whereas marriage is not an event, right? Marriage is journey. It's not an event. No. And we, can't, we can't give so much importance to the event. The importance has to be given to the, what it actually is. Um, and same with funerals. I mean, I know now today it's not always in our hands because government regulations and all the rest of it. But <clears throat> it, the, you, the funeral was done on the day and then you're grieving. A year you can't grieve because you're dealing, you, it hasn't happened yet and you're planning and you're doing this and you're waiting and it's, but you can't, you're going to grieve because you've already lost the person, but it, it just kind of, what's the word? It drags out things and it doesn't help you to focus on what's important. Right? The, the, the cremation and the, the ritual part is supposed to be done quickly and then you focus on the grieving process and the healing from that. Even with the marriage, you get quickly the, the ritual part, the ceremony is over, and now you focus on the integrating into the family. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But the, the how much importance are we giving things should be proportional to how, how much they actually going to um, increase the quality of our life. An event cannot increase the quality of our life. Right? An, an event can never increase the quality of our life. It's, it's always how we 
do things. It's our virtues, our decisions, our attitudes. That's what's improving the quality of our life. Okay, coming back to Abhimanyu, who was just adorable um, with the way he treated every single person. And I guess this was his big day because he was getting married. And so literally Abhimanyu gets married. Um, the two of them are having their cute little romance. Tripata, Arjuna, Yudhishthira, Virat, all sit down. Uh, Krishna, how can I forget Krishna? <laughs> <laughs> Main person to be sitting there. Sit down and discuss. We have to plan for the war. <clears throat> and um, Drupata, or Drishtadyamu, the son, Draupadi's brother, has said, the, so Drupata advises uh, Yudhishthira. And so here also you see this, Pandu died, and so they've never had this fatherly figure looking after them. They had Bhishmacharya, uh, but maybe not, uh, Bhishmacharya didn't guide them quite in the same way. Tripata really advises that, you know, the, what's the dharma of a king and how a king responds when they're living their dharma and how a king is going to respond when they're not living a dharma and so you see this, and these are the sections of the Mahabharata that get studied for when you want to learn about management, when you want to learn about psychology, when you want to learn about leadership. This section where Drupada is talking to Yudhishthira is completely on leadership qualities and how to manage people when you want, because what do they want now? They want to gather an army. If the, if the war is going to be fought, you need to gather an army. And so he said that that's the first thing you should, you should start doing. And Drishya Dhimyu said, Duryodhana has actually already been doing it. But of course, you have been in hiding, so you can't do it. <clears throat> but since you've already announced where you are and who you are, like tonight itself, we need to send out messengers. And as I just said, these messengers are very efficient, huh? Like, I think they beat our email because we always calling each other saying, did you see my email? And I'm always like, no. <laughs> Whereas this messenger tracked you down wherever you are and held you and gave you the message. <laughs> I think I think it was a cool system. Um, <clears throat> so they list out who would be their allies. Um, and this is where you see Drupata's insight. He's Drupata is so clear in his thinking of why a king would choose to be Duryodhana's ally and who would choose to be um, uh, Yudhishthira's ally. And it was all based on if that king was following Kshatriya Dharma, the king will do this. Uh -huh. so, so this is like, like I said, management is so much of management is understanding people and how they think, um, which is not always easy. And it's a, it's a whole wing of psychology. <clears throat> so they go, all the, the messengers go out to all the different um, places where they want to get their allies. Krishna is sitting with them. <clears throat> when this whole discussion is happening. Abhimanyu is married has happened, Krishna is there. And, how? and then we move to Bhishmacharya telling Duryodhana, <clears throat> we should ask Krishna, Dwarka's army is the strongest. And Duryodhana's reply is, Krishna will never side us. Everybody already knows how fond Krishna is of the Pandavas. Everybody did already know this. Um, and then Bhishma says, you don't know Krishna. And it sounds like such a casual line. He says, Krishna will never turn anyone away. 
Mm. Sounds like such a, you know, you can read the Mahabharata and you're reading, 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 and it can get so easily just lost in that. And why am I making such a big deal about this? Because we seeing in the Mahabharata Krishna as a person, and then it's so easy for us to think about Krishna as a person. And so, and this is what Bhakti Shastra does. You're hearing the stories and Krishna goes and visits Arjuna and then Krishna brings Abhimanyu and then they're teasing him. And, then they, and so Krishna becomes this person, right? Who's, who's teasing his nephew about getting married and saying, you know, like, did you see her? Because she, I don't know, I don't think you're going to like her. And the whole time she's in this veil and then the veil drops and they all oh, watch Abhimanyu's face and they're like, you like her. And it's all so cute. And Krishna becomes so much of a personality, you know, the uncle that teases and the uncle that. And then you forget nameless, formless, infinite, all pervading truth. So in Bhakti Shastra, we see the personality so that we create that sentiment, so we feel a connection. Yeah. But the downside of seeing Krishna as a person is he likes Arjuna means he won't like Duryodhana. Hmm. And that makes him like us. And that's not true. He's not like us. <laughs> and this is why you see, this is, you know, Bhishma <clears throat> during the game of dice is so incredibly disappointing. Like why on earth is he praised? Like, you know, he's only, we should only be praying, praising Bhishma Charya if he stopped that ridiculous game of dice. And if he stood up for Draupati in the court, but he did neither. So then why do we praise Bhishmacharya? Because he had this knowledge. Krishna was a person in a body, this character that came to visit the Pandavas while they were in exile, this king of Dwarka with 16,000 wives. <laughs> but Bhishma had that clarity of thought where he could say, Krishna never turns away anyone. Now, he's made his mistakes, and maybe it wasn't a mistake, right? Like, not stopping the game of dice, is that Bhishma's mistake? No, but it would have been really nice if he did, because he had the ability to. And stand up for Draupadi, why he got confused about dharma in that moment is beyond me. Like he was taught dharma by Yamraj, just like Yudhishthira was. And usually he's really clear on dharma. And then that day on the court, he's like, I don't know. Can you be gambled? Can't you be gambled? Hey, what happened to Bhishmacharya? Like, <laughs> I guess we all have our bad days. Maybe that was the you know play of how it was supposed fate played out. And he had to be in that frame of mind on that particular day. But there's so many incidences where it's Bhishma that makes comments about Krishna and they so clear that Krishna is God. He's not a person. And at no point in time did Bhishma see Krishna as a person. Like never. And you know, it's, it's not easy to do because there were so many people alive at that point in time and it was so easy to just treat Krishna as a person. You know, and even when we've lived in the ashram and we've, you know, we've, I've lived with Guruji and Swamiji and then I know, I know they're these amazing people. And then we have very everyday interactions and you can so easily be <laughs> not mindful of the person's divinity. Hmm. Because, you know, that we become, that the mind becomes inalert, casual, careless, whereas you never see this in Bhishma, not when it comes to Krishna. And you never see it in Yudhishthira either. Arjuna, you see it. 
are you not takes Krishna to be, you know, buddy? Even though there's so much devotion um, and the affection that they have is, is and, you know, Krishna wanted that also. Krishna wanted the affection. Krishna wanted Yashoda to treat him like a son. He wanted Arjuna to treat him like a friend. Um, so, Bhishma says, Krishna will never turn anyone away. And you should go and ask. We should go and ask. If we're fighting the war, we should go and ask Krishna. And so this story is so well known. Everybody knows the story. Both Arjuna and Duryodhana go to meet Krishna. But you know how Krishna and everybody went back and then Arjuna and the wedding and then now, because <laughs> Krishna was just sitting with Arjuna and Yudhishthira and everyone. But then suddenly he was back in Dwarka. But that's his home. So that's where he should be. So now he's there. And then Arjuna has gone <laughs> to ask for the war. Duryodhana has also gone to ask for the war. Duryodhana comes first. He's very happy with himself that he has arrived first because that's usually the rule, whoever comes first. They, they uh, are given the, they get to ask first. If you come first, you get to ask first, right? Yeah, logical, just logistics. <clears throat> um, but again, the hand of destiny, Krishna sleeping, which I love. I love that he naps. <laughs> what am I doing this afternoon? I'm, I'm going to be like Krishna. I'm going to go nap. <laughs> you can't be like Krishna in any other way. But you know, in this way, we can definitely be like Krishna. <laughs> <clears throat> then Arjuna comes along and Duryodhana gets so annoyed. But Arjuna is younger. And, you know, this, I've seen artwork where Duryodhana is like literally sitting above Krishna's head on Krishna's bed. But that's not how it was. It would be like, you know, when you walk into a room, the bed's on one side. And then there's like chairs sometimes in people's rooms. Um, so there's a chair and it's positioned behind, slightly behind the bed. Um, not at an angle you'd be able to see if you were sleeping on the bed. Just the, the layout of the room is such. It's a really nice chair. It's Krishna's bedroom. It's probably a very comfortable chair. Arjuna walks, so of course when Duryodhana walks in, Krishna is sleeping. He sits on the comfortable chair because that's what Duryodhana does. <laughs> and this was a interesting comment that when we when we talking about abhimanyu behaving so beautifully and then i think the pandava are the i don't know what to call them draupadi's five sons also you know there's this line where yudhishthira is saying when he's seeing their kids and he's happy with the way they're behaving that the you know this is important because the riyodhana doesn't know how to behave and say, so again, it can be such a casual statement that you can overlook. But you see it, how important it is in this scenario, right? So he, and again, you see it when, again, Abhimanyu is born to the Pandavas who were very, very wealthy. And Dwarka is very, very wealthy. Dwarka has the most powerful army. So like a very powerful city. He could easily also have that sense of, we see it, right, sometimes in kids, that little bit, little bit spoiled, little bit entitled, little bit arrogant. Sometimes a lot entitled, a lot arrogant, but sometimes just little, little creeps in because they have, well, they, deserve it. they have so many maids fluffy rushing around. After, after a while, they feel like, you know, they are the center of the universe. <laughs> Whereas Abhimanyu didn't have zero zero of that. The yeah, world revolved around Krishna. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> um, when Arjuna comes in, Arjuna sits on the floor near the entrance 
which happens to be as the layout of the room was, near the feet of, so it is head and it is feet. Um, but it was because if you walk into somebody's room when they're sleeping, you're gonna wake them up. So the idea was you like stay at the door so you're not disturbing. Although Krishna wasn't disturbed, huh? when Duryodhana went and sat on this chair. <laughs> Um, but Krishna does wake up, and so naturally his eyes fall on Arjuna, who's sitting on the floor in his line of vision. <clears throat> and says, oh, Arjuna, you have come. And Duryodhana doesn't say, hello, Haryom, namaste, normal Indian greetings. He says, I knew you were biased. First sentence. Meaning, I'm here too. You're not acknowledging me. You're only acknowledging Arjuna. And Krishna's reply is factual. Oh, Duryodhana, I didn't see you. <laughs> because to see him, you have to turn. <clears throat> and then Krishna says, well, I know very well why you're both here. Um, one of you can have the army. The other one of you can have me. I will be unarmed. The army will listen to your instruction. So now who gets to choose first? The one who comes first. But Krishna saw Arjuna first. So who gets to choose first? This is an interesting rule. When I read this rule in the Mahabharata, I was like, I don't know who made this rule. I don't know if I agree with it. The youngest gets to choose first. <laughs> That's the rule. In families, in India, when there is dispute about who gets to choose first, because we don't know who came first or who this first or that first, then the default rule is the youngest gets to choose first. I, you know, in my head, when I'm thinking that's not fair, because of course I've got a younger sibling. <laughs> so obviously I don't think it's fair. <laughs> Although becoming a Swamini really helps. <laughs> I remember when gifts would come, when people from overseas would come, we don't do it as much anymore. But when gifts would come, like if somebody came from India or Fiji to when we were living in South Africa and they take out all the saris and yeah, youngest chose first. We actually used to follow that rule. Um, between my three siblings, it didn't really matter. Youngest was a boy. <laughs> we didn't compete for what was given. <laughs> and between my sister and I, we usually shared, but it was practiced. When you live in this big extended family situation, it was kind of like, they the most immature, I'm making myself feel better here. <laughs> so they're going to tantrum the most. So let them have what they want. The rest of us are all mature enough to be able to handle it. <laughs> I'm guessing that's the reasoning, I'm guessing. Um, or possibly Dharma is if you older, you look after. So then you give them the first choice. So Arjuna is younger than Duryodhana. Duryodhana was born a couple of months after Yudhishthira. So he's a good three or four years older than Arjuna. So Arjuna gets to choose first. We know the story. We know Arjuna chooses. Krishna. So Yodhana is so happy. Uh, in fact, when we did the Mahabharata play, when that New Zealand group came, I don't know if you remember the scene, they did it so well. The character playing the Yodhana in, from the New Zealand team was Rahul, and he did such a good job of the scene because he sits there smug, and then, you know, he, Arjuna says, I choose Krishna. And he's like, yes. And then he leaves Dwarka saying, yeah, Bhishmacharya is going to be so proud of me that I got the army. <laughs> like he doesn't even know. He doesn't even know what he's done is 
<laughs> gonna guarantee that they've lost the war. <laughs> There's a so Arjuna chooses Krishna. Uh, the Ryodhana is very happy. So Ryodhana goes to see Balram because Balram is the Ryodhana's guru. Who is Balram? Krishna's brother. Um, so the Ryodhana being uh, had learned mace fighting from Balram. Remember I said there were only four of that caliber. And so Balram and um, Balram has a very soft spot for the Ryodhana. The way Krishna had soft spot for Arjuna, Balram had this soft spot for Duryodhana. And this is, you know, you don't see it in the Bhagavatam. In the Bhagavatam, when you read, Balram is a child. And as a child, Balram and Krishna's relationship was really cute, nice, strong, really strong. Not once they get to Dwarka. In the Mahabharata, when you see Balram and Krishna's relationship, it's very strained. Yes. That's why when we do the Dasha avatar and they say Balram is one of the avatars, it's, it can't be. Balram can't be one of the avatars. He, he's, he's alcoholic very clearly. There's no, there's no mincing of words in the Mahabharata. They cannot, cannot. Um, Unless it's another Balram they're talking about, but it's not Krishna's brother. And here you see, so Duryodhana says, will you fight? Because he knows Balram is fond of him. And here you'll see Balram's absolute devotion for Krishna. He says, I will never fight against Krishna, ever. And so there, and this is this, this, this incredible paradox in Balram. Which, you know, so you compare when, when we, we, we know, okay, when the avatar takes place, so Krishna is avatar of Vishnu. When avatar takes place, then Lakshmi always comes down with Vishnu. And so in the Mahabharata, we don't see, we don't see Rukmini at all. But in the, in the Bhagavatam, it's Rukmini that comes down as avatar of um, of, of Lakshmi. And in some of the other Puranas, it's Radha. But, and actually most people don't realize this, they were never here at the same time. Lakshmi either came as Radha or as Rukmini. And so many times there's these stories of the two of them competing. It never happened. Um, because they didn't, they didn't physically manifest at the same time. There are some stories in Devi Bhagavatam of in heaven, where, um, but there it's Lakshmi and Radha existing at the same time, which is also interesting because Radha is incarnation of Lakshmi. Okay, so um, Vishnu comes as Krishna, Lakshmi comes as Rukmini. And Sheshnag always takes avatar. And so it's Sheshnag that comes as Balram. Um, there's the story that after the Ramayan, whatever was like untied, unfinished in the Ramayan, got finished in the um, Krishna avatar. Um, so in the Ramayan, Sita was kidnapped by Ravana and had to go through so much saga. Then she was exiled by Ramji and then so much Sagar. And then, so when Krishna avatar was taking place, it is said, like it's not actually written in Bhagavatam. This is more Katakaras that tell the story. Lakshmiji looked at Vishnu and said, last life I did enough drama. This life I want a really simple avatar. I should be born in the palace and just leave me there. I don't want to have to go running around here, there and everywhere. <laughs> And so you see Rukmini, pretty much that's where she lived in Dwarka, ruling Dwarka. Krishna had to go running around everywhere, but she stayed peacefully in Dwarka. And when Sheshnag was taking Avatar, he said, last life I came as your younger brother. And so this life, let me come as your older brother and I'll tell you what to do. 
Now, that, like I said, this is not documented anywhere. But if you take that, if you just take that mindset, that it won't work. Sheshnak is servant. You come as older brother wanting to tell Krishna what to do, kid. it won't work. And in, in Ramavatar, when he came as Lakshman, we adore Lakshman. You know, when we do Balvihar camps, and you know, who's your favorite in the Ramayana? Actually, some of the boys, it's not Ram, it's Lakshman. Maybe that's got to do with my storytelling skills also. <laughs> because Lakshman is the one that gets up and says, I don't know what to do. And Ram just smiles peacefully. <laughs> the boys don't want to smile peacefully. They want to be the one that's getting up. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, Rama Lakana, we the, the, we hold their names in as one. Like that bond between them is so tight. Whereas you don't hear Balram's name with Krishna so often. You do, but I didn't even know he existed till I joined Ashram. Yeah, he's not as well known. <clears throat> Even now, you walk down Bombay streets, and if you ask them who's Balram, many people don't know. They don't know who's Lakshmi and Saraswati, forget Balram. <laughs> There's that interview, if you've seen it. No? They're standing at a traffic light in Bombay, and they, they're saying Happy Diwali. And so the person is Hindu saying Happy Diwali, and they'll say, you know, uh, which, which one's Saraswati and which one's Lakshmi, and they don't know. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's okay. Only we can be so accepting. <laughs> Balram is um, Balram's character is painful because you know when you see Balram's character, and usually with people who are addicted to alcohol, there's so much sadness for them to get addicted. Like you're only drinking that much because of sadness. And you really see that sadness come out, Balram. And why? It's because he's the older brother. But Krishna steals all the attention. And so then this incredible sense of low self-esteem and insecurity and unworthiness. And the lesson of Balram's life is, let, let Bhagwan be boss, you be servant. <laughs> you try and boss over that, it doesn't work. <laughs> And you're thinking, yeah, as if I'm going to be born as Bhagwan's brother or sister for me to make that decision. But even in our lives, right? Are we bossing? We're not bossing. We're not telling Bhagwan how our day should be, who we should meet, how much money we should earn, where we should live. We're not telling him. <laughs> nice checklist for who we want to marry. No, we don't tell. <laughs> Of course, we're bossing him. <laughs> Will it work? It won't work. Hmm. Balram knows very clearly that the Riyodhana is going to die. And this is their last meeting. And so when Duryodhana, he doesn't say a word. He says only one line to Duryodhana, I will never fight against Krishna. He doesn't even say, wish you well. He doesn't say, may you win, nothing, nothing. Because he can't, he can't go against Krishna. <clears throat> and so here you see so much love for Krishna, so much loyalty to Krishna, but at the same time, there's this conflict with him, within him about letting Krishna <laughs> be who Krishna is. Mm -hmm. and, this, and it's always to bring it back in our head. Like we assert ourselves and then we say we want to surrender to God's will. This is Balram's heartache. He's constantly asserting himself. But what he really wants is to be able to accept and surrender Krishna's will. 
And when he came as Lakshman, he did. Lakshman was so happy. He got 13 years in the forest, so happy. That last year was a bit of tough, but the 13 years were awesome. <laughs> then even when they got the kingdom again, Lakshman was so happy. He got a beautiful wife. No heartache. Why? Very happy. You, you the boss, I'm the servant. It's only when we try to assert our will against the Lord that it's going to cause this misery. Coming back to Arjuna and Krishna. Arjuna chose Krishna and then Duryodhana leaves and then Krishna is very cheeky. We think Krishna is cheeky for stealing butter. No, no, no. Krishna is cheeky for all these comments. He looks at Arjuna and says, Arjuna, you sure you made the right decision? It is a war after all. Shouldn't you have taken the army? <laughs> like so seriously. <laughs> Arjuna's reply is so nice. Arjuna says, how much are you going to test me? Didn't I choose you already? <laughs> this is Bhakta and Bhagwan relationship at its best. <laughs> <laughs> And then Arjuna goes further to say, since you're not going to be picking up a weapon, be my chariot here. Because I want you close to me at all times. So firstly, choose the Lord. Secondly, keep him close. Sometimes we choose the Lord, but we still see him as very far. Arjuna did it so nicely. Keep him close. And then driving chariot is not driver. Are you in church? You know, in those days, as like it is today, in the battle, the person fighting can't say, go this way, go that way. But where the chariot goes plays a crucial part in whether you win or you lose. So you're giving that person a lot of um, authority, um, power, responsibility. Arjuna really chose very well. And then when Krishna was teasing Arjuna, like, you sure you made the right decision? Krishna said, what if you lose because you chose me? Because, you know, if you had the army, you could win and you just chose me. Now, what if you lose already? You don't have such a big army. And, you know, I'd, I, whenever we tell the story, anybody telling the story, I didn't do it, but the person telling the story will always ask the audience, who will you choose? The audience has satsangis, so they'll always say Krishna. <laughs> really, <laughs> do we choose Krishna? This, this is how you'll know if you choose Krishna. Arjuna's reply to that was, if choosing you means we lose, I choose to lose. Yesterday, somebody was telling me they, um, they had a, where Shri Shri Ravi Shankar was in conversation with them and they were asking about how come Sindhis have so much grace on them, like so much ashram, so many santa, so many, I don't know in what context that they were saying that. I mean, everybody has grace on them, but maybe they feel particularly blessed. <clears throat> um, or maybe maybe it was in the context of they they wealthy. I'm not sure quite what the context was. <clears throat> and he replied, during India and Pakistan divide, they chose their religion.
instead of their land and their wealth. And this is so true, right? Stories, I mean, we hear so many stories because Hong Kong, there's a significance in the community and some of them remember divide. Yeah, some of these aunties, uncles, they, they'll tell you, my father left with the shirt on his back. And so, you know, this family that I was talking to who had this conversation with Ravi Shankarji, they said, the mom wore a jacket, even though, of course, India is so hot, you don't need to wear a jacket, just so she could fill all the pockets with all her necklaces and all her earrings and all the diamonds. And that's how they left. <sighs> Literally, they left overnight during India-Pakistan divide. Like, not even overnight, in that, in that literally that hour, those two hours. You, whatever you could reach, you took, you left. And mostly they reached for people. They found their family members because everybody's leaving. Some people were separated. Some families were separated during the divide, which is horrible like horrible, horrible. But some families, the story is they went to go find the kid, the brother, the this one, the that one. I mean, of course your kids, but sometimes even fully grown up adults wanting to find the siblings so that you can at least go to the same part of India. Like you, when, when they Sindhis got to India, you were sent, you're there everywhere. It's not like everyone got to the same place and you could meet up with your family members and you could meet up with your friends and then they were sent again. And so many after being sent to different parts of India left to America, to Africa, to this place. And so, so displaced, so displaced. Whereas they had huge homes in Sindh. So much wealth in the bank in Sindh. Their lockers were full. But they chose Hindu, God. Such a beautiful way of seeing it. Yeah, it's so nice to belong to a tradition that chose God. If it means I lose my money, will I choose God? They did. Yeah. Then you're choosing God. No. If I say I choose Krishna, but not because nothing should go wrong, then I'm not choosing Krishna. I'm choosing nothing should go wrong. So really, really, this... Uh, Krishna teasing Arjuna is always for our benefit. Krishna's teasing is always for our benefit. Because <laughs> Arjuna had to say this sentence. If choosing you means losing the war, I choose to lose the war. It's not said lightly. It's not Arjuna maska find Krishna. Yeah. There was enough, you know, this is, Arjuna didn't see Krishna as God. Arjuna saw Krishna as friend, as buddy who he would talk to he so casually. Like, hey, pass me that. <laughs> That's how Arjuna spoke to Krishna. So he wouldn't do maska. Yeah. Like when there's a formal relationship you do, um, you, you, you pay lip service or you be diplomatic. Or, but that was not their relationship. Their relationship was very affectionate and, and also very, very casual. Um, so pretty much everyone had already decided at the game of dice who who was going to side the uh, Pandavas and who was uh, going to side the Kauravas. And so 
every king that had been approached had already made their choice. There was this, and then the story will continue. And next week, the, the war still doesn't happen just yet because Yudhishthira thinks, let's try one more time for peace. And so Krishna goes as the, yeah, as the messenger, the diplomat, the ambassador, you know, to do those negotiations, <clears throat> which is a very fun incident also. <clears throat> But there was this one king, and then it, it actually it happens a little later, but it's it kind of fits in here nicely with the bit of the story that I'm telling. There was this one king who has a really big army. I should remember their names, shouldn't I? Um, you please read Mahabharata and learn all the names and be better than me. <laughs> he he arrived at the war and he was like, I really don't know whose side to be on because. You know, of course, Yudhishthira is noble and, and virtuous and dharmic, but then you know, the, uh, Bhishma has been uh, ally to us for so many years, and then to go against Bhishma seems a bit ungrateful. Not Duryodhana, Bhishma. A lot of people were there because of Bhishma. Bhishma in his younger days was very dynamic, very helpful, very um, uh, did a lot. Uh, and won a lot of people's hearts. Um, as a, as a when he was young, he was um, more more passionate, more more determined, more expressive. So he he was he was very like I don't know which army to join, but I know I can't not join because you know, then I'll be held Kshatriya Dharma. Basically, you take a side. <laughs> don't sit here. Don't do nothing. In Kshatriya Dharma, you don't not do anything. You don't take the fifth and sit quietly. No. <laughs> be bold. Be brave. Stand up. Fight for something. <laughs> do something. Have an opinion and, you know, make it happen. That's Kshatriya Dharma. <clears throat> So he turned up to the war, but he wasn't sure which side to take. So he said, you know, there's, hey, what's the number? All together in the Mahabharata war on day one, I think it was something like 14,000 million? 14 million, right? I think it's million. You can please Google this. People. <laughs> Soldiers. So he said, somebody is going to have to feed them all. So my army won't fight. We'll cook. <laughs> that way, I will serve both armies. And so imagine, it's a war, but they're eating from the same kitchen. Hmm. How many is it? How many people fought in the Mahabharata war? Google knows the answer. My kids find it for me very often. I just never remember it. Which I thought is such an interesting thing. Like how come nobody else thought about this? Who's gonna feed all these soldiers? Yeah. So one nation took up the job of just working the kitchen. I, I think about it, 14 million people, that's a lot of potatoes to peel. <laughs> Guess you do need an army. <laughs> uh, it says 3.94 million warriors. 3 4 million, not 14 million. Mm. Uh, huh? 18 Akshanis, nobody understands 18 Akshanis. 3.9, I rounded it up, 4 million. <clears throat> okay. So all the kings had been allocated to where they're going to be. We'll stop here. Why? Because I didn't read the next bit. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Today was mainly story, not much.
Yes. So you're talking about Krishna's view of Krishna. It's not just a person. Yeah, Krishna is not a person. So when we think about Krishna's practice, so you have to decide are you bhakta or are you jnani? So if you're bhakta, he's person only. He's your best friend, he's your beloved, he's your protector, mentor, taker. He's very real. And then as your bhakti grows, you'll be able to see beyond the form. Because he is larger than. Vedanta ends, we see, nameless, formless, infinite, immutable. Which one should you do? Play with it. No, I'm not kidding. You have to find what works for you, no? Most of us want him to be a person. After a while, the devotion itself becomes mature. Guruji says, Pakka, ripe. And your devotion is ripe. And you'll see him as not a person. When your devotion is kacha, <laughs> he's person only. <laughs> Did I answer your question? Oh. <laughs> I said, Dhamma, Sattame, Dhamma, Sama, Jyoti, Dhamma, Vidyama, Adhanda, Om, Purnamata, Purnamita, Purnam, Purnamita, Shruti, Purnasya, Purnamata, Purnamita, Shishyate,